Uh, today, in just a few moments, I want to share with you. I want to share with you a passage, or how do I say a, a phrase? I want to share with you a phrase that changed the way that I see the gospel. I want to share with you a phrase that comes out of a simple kids game. And yet, it spoke to me so profoundly. It's funny, it's powerful, it's a great illustration. I'm going to share that with you in just a few minutes. But one of the things that I want to do first is I want to kind of catch you up a little bit. I want to talk about this series that we've been in because there's some important parts that I can't let you miss, okay? And so we are continuing in our series entitled Family Reunion. We are reuniting. We are coming back together. It's been several weeks, four months even, and since we were all together in this series, we're all coming back as one family. And what we've been doing is we've been treating this moment that we're at right now as kind of like a family talk, if you will. Just imagine everybody's gathered together. Maybe it's a post-Thanksgiving meal, or maybe, maybe it's a real family reunion. And at the end of that, some dude, some woman, the patriarch of family stands up and says, listen, ding, 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 ding. I need to share something with you. All right. I kind of am the one doing that with us in this series. There are some things that are on my heart for us as a church. I want to be able to share those things together with you. I want to talk about what it means for us to move forward from the season we're in into the next one. As we've been praying, uh, preparing as we've been studying as we've been teaching through these they kind of went from they kind of went from being these little discussions to being something larger being something more of a rally cry if you will it went from well just moving into this year where we thought it might be like any other to seeing a year that is well it's been nothing like any other and we're only in june we're only in july and we have the other parts of the year still to come. There's something going on. I think there's something for the Lord to say. And so in my quiet time this past week, as I was reading, as I was thinking about what we would talk about here today, I want to take you to a passage of scripture that kind of outlines what it means for us in a family reunion. If you have your Bibles, you have a tablet, you want to follow along, I'm going to take you to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read a few verses out of here, and then we're going to bounce around a little bit and paint a picture today. It's going to be fun. I think it's going to encourage you, okay? And so in Hebrews chapter 10, let me just share this with you. It starts off by saying, therefore, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. So many times when we read the Bible, we're reading through the New Testament, we see this kind of language, don't we? Brothers and sisters. And sisters, and we've talked about this in this series, that you and I, well, we become brothers and sisters. We become family, that the church is indeed a family. I was talking to my daughter on the way over here while I was driving the church this morning. I was going over some of my notes, and I came to this portion, and I was saying, you know what, daughter, Sydney, you know what the strange thing about all of this is in the kingdom of God is that while you're my daughter, you're my sister. That's weird. And while, Lucas, you're my son, you're also my brother. That is really weird. My mother is my sister. My father is my brother. Kingdom of God is just like, whoa, this is different. We're all family. I have some questions. I wonder what that's going to be like. My wife is also my sister. I'm not sure what to do with that one. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we're all family. We're all united together. And so he goes on and he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have what? Confidence to enter. Since we have confidence to enter the most high place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. We have this confidence. Since we have that confidence, let us. And he's going to give us a series of imperatives, some let us. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let us, church, draw near. This is another thing that we've been talking about in this series, that we as a church, as believers, as Christians, are committed to growing in our faith, drawing near to God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies purified or washed with pure water. He says, let us draw near. 
And then he'll go on and he'll say, let us hold unswervingly. I like this word picture, unswervingly. Let us hold on without deviating to the left and the right. Let us keep our course. Let us have a target and be aimed. Let us not swerve to hold on unswervingly. And he goes on and he says, and let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds and not giving up meeting together. This is important, especially in this season right now. Let's not give up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Again, I know for some of you, you can't come yet. Come when you can. This is important. What we do together, when we come together underneath the name of Jesus and we stand united and we sing songs, it's a huge deal. So much so that Jesus would say, you need this. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints, right? But encouraging each other, spur each other, encourage one another. And this, my friends, well, this is who we are as a church. This is what we do as the body of Christ. We draw near to God. We hold on to the promise that we have. We encourage each other. We build each other up. And he goes on, and then he has this dash. He says all of these other things. These things are really important. It's really important for the life of a church that you would build each other up, that you hold on to the promises of God, that you not give up gathering together. And then he's going to throw in a dash as if, there's something extra to come alongside. There's a really important point to be made after the dash, and here's what it says. And he says, and all the more as you what? Don't leave me up here by myself. All the more what? As you see the day approaching. You need to do these things. You need to be together. You need to encourage. You need to spur. You need to stand strong. All the more as you see the day approaching. What does it mean, the day approaching? What day? What is the day? What is the day? It's nothing under, other than the second coming of Christ. It's the return of the king. He says, you need to be doing these things, and even more so when that day is indeed coming. Well, my friends, you've heard me talking about this. I believe, our church believes, we believe that that day is indeed approaching. And so as we started off this series, it, again, was kind of like, let's just get everybody in the room. Let's get back connected to our core message of who we are and what we're about. But as we've gotten closer to it, as we consider what it is that Jesus is doing in this season well, it kind of went from a little bit of conversational to rally cries. It went from something that was just kind of an idea in my heart to I believe that Jesus is wanting to say something profound to us and has been saying things to us. Over the last several weeks, we've talked about a few really important words, action verbs for us in this season. The first one is that I believe that Jesus is saying to us that in this moment that we are to open up our eyes and to Look, to look. The first thing that Jesus is saying to us is to look, to wake up, to take off the blinders, to look at the signs, to see the day is indeed approaching. I believe that Jesus is saying to us, look. I believe that the return of Jesus is imminent. You remember the word? Imminent, meaning that it could happen at any moment, meaning that it could be fulfilled today, that the return of Jesus is indeed imminent. And I believe that God is calling us, not just City Church, but the church at large, to wake up and to look into the horizon and see what's coming. The day is indeed coming. I believe that Jesus is also saying to us that we are to unite, that we are to unite that if this day is coming, that we are to be about our Father's business and stop allowing everything to be so divisive and yet stand together united with the thing that does make us one, that does make us family. You and I can be different. I can have more money in the bank. You can have more money in the bank. We can have different skin colors. We can have different educations and backgrounds and upbringings. And yet when Jesus is in your heart, when the Holy Spirit is inside of you, well, 
That's the thing that unites us. That becomes the thing that defines us. We become brothers and sisters in the Lord, and Jesus is uniting us. Jesus says, lift lift up your eyes and look and see. Jesus says, I'm calling my church to become one and stop being so divided. And then finally, he says to us, in this season, well, this is the hour to prepare. Jesus says to us that I am preparing my church, not prepared, not past tense, but active tense, that God is presently working on his church, I believe, at large, and that God is working on this church. And if God is working on this church, then that means he's working on the individuals that make up this church. And so he comes along and he says, I want you to prepare for you as an individual. He says, I want you to prepare your heart. I want you to prepare your head. He says, I want you to prepare your home. And we are to prepare as our church. That we're growing, we're maturing in our discernment and becoming spirit-led. Jesus is saying to us, look, the time is here, time to unite, time to prepare. And today, I think that there's a fourth thing that we haven't talked about yet. And Jesus, in this moment, if all of these things are coming, those are kind of introspective. Those are inside the house. It's inside the family of God. And yet, there is one thing left that God is still doing, and he's calling us to become light, that we might become light. And so today, over the next few minutes, I want to talk about this concept for a second, and I want to relate it to a game. I want to just pull some phrases out of a game, a game that we used to play as kids, a game that was actually played outside. I know that's hard to believe, but kids used to go outside. Did you know that? Did you know that? Like before tablets and phones and devices that you used to go outside and ride your bicycle and play and games outside. I know it's hard to believe, but kids used to go outside. In fact, when I was a kid, it was so much fun that I did not want to come home. And so when the street lights came on, that was a problem because why? The street lights are on, it's time to come home. Street lights are on, it's time to come home. And so I want to tell you about this little game that we used to play as kids called, well, hide and seek, hide and seek. Last week, if you were here with us in the room, I told you about how this was my favorite game to play with my kid. And today, I want to tell you a few reasons why it's my favorite game to play as a kid. There's a few phrases out of this that I think will bless us today that I think are going to encourage us, okay? And so how many of you played hide and seek back in the day, right? I think we all played hide and seek at some point or another, right? You didn't raise your hand back here. I, I'm assuming that you played hide and seek. Those of you online, I hope you played hide and seek or you were deprived as a child. Like, please play some hide and seek in your life, right? And so the premise of the game is really simple, isn't it? One person is it, you're it, you're the one who's going to find everyone else. They close their eyes, they hide their eyes, they begin counting. And then everyone else, well, their job is pretty simple. One person is the one who goes and seeks, and the others are the ones who hide. Now, this game is different at different stages of life. With my daughter, who's three years old, and I play with her inside the house, I go to find her. Ready or not, here I come, and she's giggling, as I told you about. When she comes to find me, one, two, seven, ten, here I come, daddy. But the adult version of that, well, the adult version is so much more fun. It was so many more layers. It was more complex. There was more space. I mean, we had more space to play in. Instead of counting to 10, you would count to 100. You know, and if you're it, right, if you're the person who's it, what do you do? You hide your eyes, you find base, wherever it is, you know, up against a tree, and you count to 100, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, right? And you come out, and you're trying to find everyone. You count to 100. What's that line you say right when you get to the end? You remember it? One, two, three. Ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, here I come. And now you're it. You're on the prowl. You're looking around. You're wandering. You're trying to find them. And then you say that line, right? You're walking around. You're looking for them. And then that line, come out, come out wherever you are. 
Come out, come out wherever you are. Ready or not, here I come. And you're on mission, and you're trying to find them. Play in hide and seek. It's great. It's fun. I love to play in hide and seek. And if you're the person who's actually hiding, well, your goals are simple as well. Don't get found. Don't get caught. Don't get tagged. And usually, especially in this a little bit older version of hide and seek that we would play, there was some sort of base. Did you guys play with a base? We had a base. We, usually a big oak tree or maybe the front porch or something. Some area was declared as base. And so if you were hiding and you made it all the way back to base without getting tagged, you're safe. If you get tagged, well, you're out. And that round is over. There's something that happens at the end of that round, assuming that that person got tagged and it's over. There's a phrase that's said. Do you remember the phrase that said? There's a phrase that's declared out in what it's meant to do. Its purpose is to call everyone back into base. It's a phrase that says to them, it's safe for you to return. It's a phrase that somebody else is it. Do you know the phrase? Well, you're going to recognize it when you see it. You may not know it right now, but you'll recognize it. Here it is. Ali, Ali, oxen free. Ali, Ali, oxen free. And what does that mean? At the end of the round, when somebody has been tagged it, when it's somebody else, when it's safe to come home, the person who is it, they begin declaring out loud, Ali, Ali, oxen free. Ali, Ali, oxen free. And this is a clear call to come home. It's a clear call to come back to the base. It's safe. It's a call that says that the one who was out to try to accuse you and tag you has now been removed and somebody else is in its place. It's a call that says, Ali, Ali, oxen free. Ali, Ali, oxen free. It's time to return. Now, as a kid, we say stuff like this and have no idea what it means. I had no idea what this meant. And yet, here I was chanting it at the end of every game, at the end of every round. Ali, Ali, oxen free. I don't don't know what this means to me. Ali, Ali, oxen free. It comes from the kids' game. It comes from hide and seek. But some of you who are generations before you might have actually played this and kicked the can Kick the can, that was a generation before my own for the most part. It's also, this phrase is sometimes used in capture the flag. Ali, Ali, ox and free. But what does it mean? Where did it originate? How did we get here? Now, you try to study this and go back and look at original language. I just geek out on this kind of stuff. Sorry, this is just what I do. I geek out on this kind of stuff. You try to go back and find it, and you won't find like an original language. What you'll find is this was an oral tradition, an oral phrase that was passed down by children. And so there's a number of different ways to say it, a number of different ways to write it, and you may have said it a different way when you were playing the game, but somewhere in there was a phrase that looked a little bit like this. Holly, Holly oxen free. And I would say this phrase and I would have it a part of the game, never knew what it meant. It was later in my life when I heard for the first time just the correct phrasing. And I realized, you know what? You've been saying this wrong all of these years. Not Ali Ali oxen free. That doesn't even make any sense. You know what the original meaning was? All ye, all ye, all come free. All ye, all ye, all come free. All ye, all ye, all come free. Now, leave it to the preacher to come and look at a kid's game in a phrase like this and to try to pull out some deeply spiritual meanings out of this, okay? But I'm telling you, when I see this, And that idea of what was happening in the game that I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes, this changed my understanding of who Jesus is. It changed my understanding of the call that he makes. And this changed my understanding of even my own role. All ye, all ye, all come free. All ye, all ye, all come free. And as a kid, man, I loved playing hide and seek. As I got older, man, the best games, I want to tell you, 
the best games of hide and seek that you could ever play, well, they were played in the dark. Okay, guys, so we're going to play hide and seek, and I think you know the game. I think everyone here has played this game before. As we said earlier, we all went over the boundaries, okay? And so, yeah, don't go past my neighbor's house over there, and um, yeah, those trees in the back, that'll be the back boundary. And this, this right here, guys, this will be the base, okay? So everybody knows where the base is. You just need to come back here, okay? And so what will happen is I'm going to be it, and this will be our base I'll count to 100. Everybody ready? Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm going to count. All right. 95, 96, 97. Oh, they're not paying attention anyway. 99, 100. Ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, here I come. Are you hiding over here? No, that's not. What about, what about over here? Are you hiding over there? No, no, that's not him either. <gasps> there you are. I got one. Tag, I got you, I got you, I got you. Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. Uh, Ollie, 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 oxen free. You, it's okay, you can come back now. Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. All ye, all ye, all come free. All ye, all ye, all come free. See, I think there's something that's a part of this story that really gives us a glimpse into the gospel and gives us a glimpse into the heart of Jesus as he makes declaration over us and in this moment, I believe, calls out, all ye, all ye, all come free. Let me show you something for just a minute. Let me take you to Romans chapter 6, a very famous verse, verse 23. And it says this, for the wages of sin is death. Now, that's nothing new. We've heard this before. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift, but the free gift of God is eternal life. That There is wages of sin. There, there's the ability for me to choose in that choice, when it's contrary to God, it separates me from him, right? Sin puts me outside. It puts me in the dark. And it puts me in a position where I cannot make my way back to base because there is one who's on the prowl, who's looking for, who wants to tag, who wants to call out, who wants to label. And yet, Jesus stands in as the free gift. And so in 1 John 4.10, it says this. Let me give you a few verses and then come back and explain them. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and that he sent his son to be the, what's the word? Propitiation. propitiation. We don't use that word very much anymore, do we? The word propitiation, a substitute, an atonement, something to take the place of. And Jesus comes and he says that God sent his son, sent Jesus to become an exchange, to become a propitiation, to stand in the place of. Now, to use our analogy, we're playing hide and seek and we're out in the dark. There is no way back. We can't find our way. We can't see the light. And yet Jesus comes on and he takes the place of the accuser, stands in and says, you know what? There's a new person that's it. I'm now the one calling you home. There has been a substitute. And so Jesus, well, I believe that Jesus is standing and he has his light and he calls out to us and he begins declaring in those same words, all ye, all ye, all come free. See, I believe that Jesus would take it further and that he would say, all ye, all ye, your sin is on me. I believe that Jesus would take it further and say, all ye, all ye, there is liberty. All ye, all ye, all come free free. And it becomes a picture of the gospel. Let me continue to paint the picture for you because, see, in this series where we are and we're having these family talks, there are some things that have been very specifically spoken to us, and I cannot shake the idea. I cannot get away from it. 
See, I think that in this season that Jesus, that God is saying something to us, to our church, to me, to you. And it's this, that, well, we're coming to the end of the game. That the round is about to be over. See, I think that Jesus is speaking to us in this moment, and he's saying that these days are indeed dark. And you don't need me to stand here and describe it for you. Turn on the news, scroll social media, just look at the world around you, and we all acknowledge, we all see that the days are increasingly dark. And Jesus would come, and he would say that these days that are dark, well, they're going to get darker. He would say that this darkness would, well, the love for the darkness would continue to grow. Look at what he says here in John chapter 3. He says, this is the judgment. This is what? That the what? That the light has come into the world. That the light has come into the world, and yet men did what? They loved the darkness rather than the, rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. The days are dark. God saw the days are dark. He sends his light into the world, and yet humanity still chooses to love the darkness more than the light. The days increased in darkness. Another problem laid out in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that the God of this age has done what? The God of this age has blinded. A blind person is trapped in darkness. They cannot see light. And he says that the God of this age, Satan, the enemy of our soul, the one who roams around like a roaring lion, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they what? They cannot see the light. They cannot even see the light. They're blinded. They cannot see the light. There is a light, but they cannot see the light. They're blinded, blinded by the light, not by the light, to the light. (laughs) Cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Have you, ever, have you ever been in darkness before? I don't mean like, I'm talking about like pitch black, like the absence of light, like a, a vacuum, a void. You ever been in that weight of darkness? Somebody after the first service came up and they told me about a family member, a relative who got trapped in a mining cave. Black, no light, well, well below the ground. I can't even imagine being trapped in the dark. Kids afraid of the dark. Some adults afraid of the dark. Alone, scared, confused, disoriented, lost, in the dark, in the dark. Yet in the dark, there is a light. And from Scripture, we see that there's a light. Who, who is the light? Jesus becomes the light. And first John, or John 8 says it this way. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said what? When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said what? I am the light of the world. world. Whoever follows me will... Oh, what a promise. What a promise. I've lived so much of my life that I was in darkness. I know what it feels like. And yet to have a promise from God that when my... Life is in him when I'm found in him that he becomes my light, and yet I would never walk in darkness again. What a promise that we have, that we would never have to walk in darkness again. But you will have the light. You will have the light. Jesus said, it's better that I go, that I would leave the Holy Spirit for you, that we would have the light. The Holy Spirit that would dwell within us becomes the light inside of us. And so Jesus says, I am the light the light. I am the light. If Jesus were talking to us today and just trying to, again, rally us around, I think there's a few things that he would say and help us to understand. The first one would be that, that I am indeed the light and that I in this season am shining my light. I'm calling out all ye, all ye, all come free, that there is a generation lost and abandoned to God turning to the things of darkness, and yet in this season, God is reaching out and sending his message and sending his light, and they would never have to walk in darkness again. Jesus says, I am the light. Those who are found in me would never walk in darkness. Jesus would go on, and he would say, not only am I the light, that I am also the seeker. If we're in this game of hide and seek, then Jesus is it. 
Jesus is the seeker. You may remember the famous passages of Scripture that describe Jesus as the one who leaves the 99 and goes after the one who is lost. He's a seeker. You may remember Jesus being the one through the parables that when there are 10 valuable coins and even though there are nine left, one is lost, Jesus is the seeker. He goes after the one. You may remember the story that paints Jesus as the seeker when a prodigal son, he leaves home, abandons all that he knows, eventually to come home and to be met with open arms. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the seeker. Luke 19.10 says it this way, for the son of man came to do what? To seek and to do what? To save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That Jesus is a seeker. He says, I am the light. I am the seeker. Well, but I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to stop here. This isn't just about me. No, you have a part to play in this game. That if I am the light, if I am the seeker, then Jesus also says to us, well, you are also the seeker, that you are also the seeker. And see, one of the things that should be happening in the life of a believer is our lives over time should look more and more like Christ, which means we should take on more and the more of characteristics of Christ, that we should be about his same behaviors, doing similar things. And so one of the things is that we become a seeker. Jesus says to us that you are a seeker. Well, you know, maybe you said it in a different way, read it in a different way. When Jesus says to his disciples, he says, come and follow me and I will make you what? I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus says, I'm going to make you a, Jesus says, I'm going to make you a seeker. In the Great Commission, what does he say? He says, go into all the world and to make disciples. Go into all of the world, sharing my gospel, telling the good news. What does that mean? Jesus says that you are a seeker. There's something so unique about the gospel that I don't understand why God would have built his economy this way, but somehow he chooses to partner with me and to partner with you, that even though that he's the light and he's the seeker, he comes along and says, you have a role to play that you also are the seeker. Maybe you remember it from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says it this way, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. Anybody grateful that the old has gone and the new has come? I mean, come on. The old has gone. The new has come. He goes on and he says, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And what did he do? He he gave us, now follow these verbs, he gave us the minister, ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. And what was he doing? And he was, he was entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Last one right here. Therefore, we are what? For Christ, God making his appeal where? Through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God comes alongside. He says, I am the light. I am the seeker. You are also a seeker. He says that I am going to give to you this ministry of reconciliation. I'm entrusting it to you, that I'm going to do something in you and through you, that it would be through us. We become Christ's ambassadors his diplomats, his representatives. Jesus comes along and he says, you know what? In this game, you're it. Tag, it is your turn. And so God makes his appeal through us. And so if Jesus does come on the scene and he's there playing the game with us and he says, you know what? I am the light. And he says, I'm a seeker, and he comes along to us, and do you know what he does? Is he takes and he puts the light over into our hands, and he says, you're a seeker like me, and he says, you are light like I am light. You are my light. 
he goes from this position of describing himself, saying, I am the light, to going to say that you are the light, that you are the light. It's easy for me to understand and accept Jesus Christ as the light. It is much more difficult for me to believe what it says here in Matthew 5, verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. This is the exact same phrase as before. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, now says, you are the light of the world. He says, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden Neither do people put light, a lamp, and put it where? Under a bowl. Nope. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He goes on, and he's talking through this, and he says, I'm the light. No, you are the light. And then I think he acknowledges the fact, or the people acknowledge the fact that they had the light, but they were doing something incorrectly with the light. Do you see it? Do you see it? What do they do with it? They put their light under a bowl. They put their light under a bowl. They were concealing their light. They were hiding their light. And so in this passage, it's speaking to this idea that says, no, 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 no. You're supposed to be the light, that you are the light, but you cannot go and hide the light. No, that light has a purpose. And Jesus begins to speak about this idea through scripture. No, you need to put this on its stand. He starts to describe the problems with the light. So for them, they were hiding the light. Let me just pose a question for you what kind of light do you have? What does it look like? Maybe for you, maybe some have this kind of light. Kind of, the, the light like a match. You know, in the moment that you strike it, whew, bright light, immediate flame, and then nothing but cold embers quick to go out. See, some people, are, their light is a bit like this. Jesus comes into their world. He shows them who he is. Their whole world is changed. Their light is ignited within them, and yet because there is no depth to them, light quickly goes out. There was a problem with their light. Some of them were hiding under the bowl. Some of us have a problem with, like a match, the light becomes burnt out. Some of us, though, well, our light is more like our light is more like this, this tea candle, kind of like a, like a flickering light, you know, not hot, not really cold, you know, somewhere just kind of in the middle. You know, it, it puts off a little bit of light. Can you see that from there? Can you guys see that on the internet? It does put off a little bit of light. See how it flickers just a little bit? But those who are in the darkness, those who are need to hear the message of all ye, all ye, all come free, they cannot see this light. There, there's something about this light, and, and it would be ignited, and it would grow, and yet, if it wasn't so fickle, if there, there wasn't something else constantly just dulling it down. So maybe it's, maybe it's not that light for you. Maybe, maybe your light is a little bit like, well, Maybe your batteries went dead. My batteries weren't really supposed to be dead, by the way. But maybe you're like this. Maybe you forgot to change the batteries. Maybe you forgot to charge the batteries. Maybe you forgot the thing that does charge the batteries. Maybe for you, you've been kind of playing church, running away from God, not in your word, not in praying. Now, you have a light that is within you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. But somewhere, well, the battery has died And Jesus says to us that we are the light of the world. What does your light look like? You are the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. I am giving you the light to play the game. Well, you are it. Here's your light. And oh, by the way, when I give you a light, well, When I give you a light, it's a a bright light. 
See, the light that I put inside of you, the light that's given to us by God, well, this is meant to be a city on a hill. It's meant to be seen from a distance. It's meant for those who are out inside of the darkness to be able to look off into the distance and say, I don't know what that is over there, but I know there's more light there than in the darkness that I find myself in now today. See, light has the ability. Light is directional. If I don't know which way to go, if I just start walking in the direction of the light, the light at the end of the tunnel. There's reasons for these things. People are in moments when they find themselves in darkness and we are being sent as a light. You are a light. What kind of light are you? What does the light look like? And so we started today and we, we were talking about Hebrews chapter 10. I wanna, I wanna go back there and then I just wanna bring you to this bottom part and let's just wrap it all up together, okay? So what we read so far in Hebrews chapter 10 was very much about this idea of let us, let us draw near to God, let us hold unswervingly, let us spur one another on, let us encourage each other as you see the day approaching. And that's where we left off. As you see the day approaching. I want to skip down to verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10. And he says, remember those earlier days after you had done what? After you had received the light. Remember the earlier days after you had received the light? He says, when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. Let me give you some context here. In Hebrews, this was a group of people, Hebrews, who were following Jesus, right? They had the light. They had the light of Jesus they had received the light. After they became a Christian, they encountered some hardships, culture around them. They were isolated. People were trying to shut them up, push them back, so much so that they come to the position where they almost abandoned the whole thing and went back to their former ways, what they used to do, what they used to know, what was comfortable for them in the past. And coming alongside here, and he says, listen, you got to remember, you received a light. And just because you're going through some suffering here, let's skip down a few verses. This is what it will say later. Just because you're going through some suffering, just because times are hard, just because the days are dark, just because you can't make sense out of everything. He says, just because of those things, don't throw it all away. Don't throw away your confidence, this hope that you cling to. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done so, done the will of God, you will receive what has been promised. And in this season, in this hard to navigate place, when it feels like, I'm not sure I can do this, listen, like the Hebrews, we have to do not throw away that we must persevere. Why? Because we know that we will receive the promise. We will receive the promise. Now, end of 37, or verse 37, the end of this chapter, this is what it says. He says, watch this, for in just a little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not delay. In just a little while, in just a little while, I feel so strongly in my heart to tell our church, to tell our people, to tell my friends, to tell my family, get ready. Prepare your hearts. Prepare your homes. Yes, generations have said this before us. The return of Jesus Christ is imminent. Anytime, any moment, anytime. And he says, listen, in just a little while, I don't even know how much a little while is any longer, but he's coming. And he's not gonna delay much longer. We looked at last time that the Lord is not slow as some understand slowness. No, he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish. Because why? He's a seeker. He's a seeker. And he's looking. Now, I believe that Jesus is speaking to our church. I believe that Jesus is speaking to the church in this season. And he says, I'm not going to delay much longer. You need to look. You need to open your eyes. You need to see the signs of the times. You need to unite together. You need to prepare. And ultimately, if you believe it to be true, if you believe that Jesus is coming back again, 
If you believe that those who are outside of relationship with him will spend eternity in hell, if you believe that idea, then we must be the lights that God has called us to be. You are the light. And in these dark days, when people are stumbling over themselves, when they're looking for answers, when they're looking for guidance and direction, you have a light. I have a light. And we are called to be a light in this city, in this community. And so God brings us to the position where he says, I'm the seeker. I'm the light. You're the seeker. You're the light. God partners with us that we become his ambassadors, that we become the ones now in this moment, in this day, in playing hide and seek, holding the light. The round is over. It's coming to an end. And the Lord is sending us to make declaration and to let your light shine and to begin to call out All ye, all ye, all come free. You in the back, you can't see this. All ye, all ye, all come free. The thing that's been holding you back for so long, the thing that has held you in bondage, the the thing the accuser has tried to label over you, that every time you tried to come home, every time you tried to make a difference, that somehow there was an accuser ready to tag you out. Jesus comes in and says, no, 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 I'm the propitiation. I have traded places. Oh, now I'm the one who's it, and I've called you home. When you come home, then you become the one with the light. Who has God called you to be a light to? Who is it in your home? Who is it in your family? Who is it in your community, in your marketplace, at your work? Who is God calling you to be a light to? Who is it that's around you that you know is in darkness at this moment? And God says, you are the light that I am sending. And he puts the flashlight in your hand and says, now you go be my ambassador and call them home. Who is it? You watching online, who is it? Jesus is sending you and he's partnering with you. Don't miss this. You get to be a part. Man, there's no greater joy than seeing someone who's been blinded, who's lived in darkness, and for the first time, the lights come on and they see it for the first time. Salvation. Man, I remember what that was like for me. Do you remember? We are the light. You're the light. I'd love to pray with you. Can we do that? If you're able to stand today, would you mind standing here in the house? I'd love for you to agree with me in prayer, especially if you're a Christian today. Listen, if you're not a Christian and you find yourself in the dark, there's no reason to stay alone and isolated and afraid and being vulnerable. Come home. Come to the light. Today might be your day. Today's your day. If you're here in the room or you're watching online. If you're a Christian in the room, what does that light look like for you? Was it a match that's, and it's gone? Is the battery going dead? Is the light flickering a bit? Or do you have a bright million candle torch? Are you ignited with passion for Jesus? Is that light visible to the others around you? If it's not, maybe today we could ask the Lord to ignite the light within us. Maybe we could do that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for what you're speaking during this season. And Lord, we, we recognize the hour that we're in. God, I know that we won't know the minute or the day, but God, we can see the signs in the, of the season. God, would you help us to look and to be attentive? God, would you help to continue to unite us together as a family, as one? I know we're not there yet. I know it's not perfect. But God, help to unite us. Help us to overcome any differences. God, I also pray for those who feel like they're in the dark. They don't know what to do next. They don't know how to navigate their lives. They're overwhelmed, feel pushed back. God, would you come and be the light for those in the moment? Would they hear your voice right now, calling them by name, calling them home? 
all ye, all ye, all come free. The gift of God, salvation of God, it's a free gift for you. Those of you who are in the room and we would say, God, my light isn't as bright as what it once was. God, my light was here and gone. Lord, my batteries are dead. God, would you ignite a light within us again? Would you ignite a passion for you, a zeal for you, a zeal for the things of God, for your word? And God, would your light shine so brightly inside of us that it becomes contagious to those around us? God, would you use our church, make us a city on a hill? God, a light shining bright, pointing to you. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.